thank you for coming here in spite of the terrible weather and I hope that our discussion will be worth it. So I will switch into English and then we will speak German during our panel discussion. It has been a subject which has entirely dominated the global business media. And um, the question really is for anyone giving a talk like the one that I'm setting out on this evening is to think of what we can usefully contribute that's new, that might gain your attention, that might grab and attract you in some way to this topic, which in some ways is mundane and everyday, but, but also in fact poses really quite serious questions of analysis. In fact, as Inflation has begun. We've begun to ask ourselves whether we really understand what it is at all. And, and I want, in a sense, to dig into that question, to render what inflation is a little less obvious, perhaps, than it might seem at first. And to do that, I'm going to use a contrast between the United States, where I live and work much of the year, and Europe, where we are now, and where the problem of inflation presents itself in two rather different ways. But inflation dominates the headlines right now. First of all, uh, as we've heard today from the ECB, is a question really about the classic inflation problem. It's somewhere between 8 and 10 percent. It could be rising more in Britain. It's going to head into the teens. And the question that central banks then have to ask is how are they going to set interest rates? And this is one way of thinking about what inflation is. It's measured by the largest measure aggregate index that we have of prices. You can use something like the GDP deflator if you want or other broad measures of prices. It's rising very rapidly right now, and central banks need to do something about it because inflation is a monetary problem and central banks run monetary policy. Another way of thinking about inflation, and this is what I really want to encourage you to do, is to try and distinguish between ways in which you think about this problem. Another way of thinking about inflation, as our chair introduced a minute ago, is just look at your electricity bill. Right? Inflation for Europeans is above all an energy price shock problem. That is the core of the entire problem as far as they're concerned. And it is an urgent one which will affect Europe in the form of a social crisis. I'll say much more about that in a second. And that is really the third dimension of inflation which increasingly is coming to the fore as the dominant preoccupation in Europe up to and including, as I will say at the end, discussion of prices as the driver of a potential political crisis in Europe. We have a social democratic chancellor who at this moment is unafraid to invoke the possibility of mob violence a la Gilets Jaunes sometime over the fall. This is a, an unusual situation for a social democrat to find themselves in. If you think of yourself as sympathetic to the socialist project, of course, those on the left will say, well, plus ça change. Um, but these are the three different ways in which I think you can think of the inflation problem in the current moment. And if you live in the United States, as I do, the classic, the first way of thinking about inflation is the one that entirely dominates the discussion. We pass, we interpret consumer price index numbers down to a single, a fraction of a decimal point. Whether it moves up or down by half a percentage point is enough to disturb the markets. We look at labor market reports to try and gauge what's going on in the finest grain detail. And all of the fo focus is on Jerome Powell and the Fed to see whether they will tweak interest rates or not. Or it's on Lael Brennard, his chief of economic policy, who is making those decisions too. And that is the world in which inflation is treated in the United States right now. And it seems to me to be, in fact, despite the news we've had from the ECB today, quite a different world from the one that Europeans inhabit at this moment. Because in Europe, I think we're facing all three of these things at once. You referred to the multiple crisis that afflict us. And I think that does in precisely capture the reality of inflation. You don't know whether you should focus on the horror number, which is 8 9%, which breaks with 50 years of price stability. You don't know whether you should focus on the even more horrendous pro prospect, say, in the UK, of energy bills going to five or six thousand pounds a year, right, crippling pensioners, or whether you should focus on the social turmoil that that will unleash, the drama is much darker, it's much more gothic, it's associated with a much wider sense of destabilization. And as a result, whereas in the US all eyes are on technocratic decision making, in Europe now I think this is becoming a much broader political and legitimatory crisis, which is why it's so urgent for us to talk about it. Nothing less than the social contract, the Gesellschaftsvertrag, is up for grabs at this moment. You might say, of course, well, that inflation, energy price shock, and social crisis are all just synonyms. They're all really just the same thing. So why would you make such a to-do about trying to distinguish them? And that's really the idea that I want to break in your minds this evening. If there's one thing that I want you to take away from this evening, it is the, I the idea that, in fact, they're not the same thing. And it is precisely Europe's drama right now that they are all converging. 
Because in the United States right now, these are passed out, they're separate, which is a much more normal situation. And you do not grasp the severity of Europe's crisis at this moment until you realize the implications of them all three coming together. They appear that way in the current moment, in other words, as essentially synonyms for each other, but that is in itself a, s a measure of the drama that we're in. It is the reason why, in some ways, and for good reason, the echoes of what happened 50 years ago, the echoes of the 1970s are so present, because the last time we had all these three things converging, movement in the statistical measures which force central banks to act, concrete price shocks from specific parts of the standard of living and the drama of social contestation was the 1970s. And I would like to refer you and encourage you to check out the, the substack by my good friend, the British journalist Duncan Weldon, who made a very good argument, I think, about this being the way in which our current moment resembles the 70s. Now, saying this to Germans, because the 70s in Germany were not very dramatic, doesn't have the resonance that it does for somebody who comes from Britain or Italy. Uh, where the 70s were a moment of really fundamental turmoil, or the United States as well. But if there's a subtext to my talk this evening, one of the other things that you might want to take away is that Britain may be a country worth watching at this current moment. Many of us have gotten very tired with its political economy subsequent to Brexit. Who has patience for this crazy island of mad people who've embarked on this ridiculous adventure? <laughs> the reason why they're, it's quite interesting, and I share, and you can tell from my accent, the kind of horror I experience in, in the post-Brexit moment, but the reason why we may need to focus on that country is because there everything is going to be acted out even more extremely than within the European Union at this point. Inflation there is going to go into the teens, 15, 16% is on the cards, and uh, the uh, energy price drama there is dramatic. The government, the, uh, the Blizz Truss's government announced measures which amount to 5% of GDP today. 5% of GDP, this is wartime, this is COVID level uh, spending that is going on there. So check out the British story, it's an important one. Why is it not obvious that an energy price shock should lead to general inflation? This is a sort of key element of the economic debate to take away, I think, at this moment. Why are these two things not identical with each other? Because in some say you'd say, well, energy prices drive through the cost structure and that drives prices up. And so an energy price shock must be equal to an inflationary shock. Well, yes, at one level, but think about the flip side of this. If you're faced with gigantically escalating energy prices, are you going to be buying the goods which you jointly consume with the high energy? The answer to that is obviously no. So what you would expect is the price of goods that are associated with high energy consumption should fall. Some of those gigantic cars which people like to drive will tend to fall. The other squeeze that is going to happen, and this is going to be very dramatic, is that as energy prices go up and households cannot substitute out of energy, their disposable income goes down, and so their ability to buy anything else, to go out in the evenings, to go to the cinema, to go on holiday, falls, and as a result of that, there will be deflationary pressure across large parts of the rest of the economy. Unless something else happens to expand people's budgets, the effect of a huge shock to their energy costs is that their ability to buy anything else is shrunken, and as a result, we will see from the autumn in Europe uh, uh, mounting deflationary pressures in the rest of the economy. In other words, a recession brought on by an inflationary shock. As the volume of energy trading measured in relation to GDP, and this is a staggering number I came across the other day, surges from 1% of EU GDP to 10% of GDP. There is a huge redistribution of purchasing power going on, which will suck demand out of other sectors and cause deflationary effects there. Another way of thinking about this effect is to think of this nationally. If you're the United States, which is a net, is, is net self-sufficient in energy, if you're the United States and you're not self-sufficient in energy, then a world energy shock like the one that we're experiencing now has a net neutral effect on the American economy. It simply shuffles purchasing power from Connecticut, which consumes uh, energy, to Texas, which produces energy. It's literally a redistribution within the national economy of the United States. If you want to understand the logic of global energy markets in the world at this moment, this graph here is a very important one because the United States disappears as a consumer of energy on net in the global economy. Why? Because of fracking. This is the story of fracking. With fracking, America becomes self-sufficient in energy. That means the American economy does not suffer a net hit from global rising energy prices. In Europe, which is, of course, a huge net energy importer, 
The effect of a rise in global energy prices is simply to suck demand out of the European economy and to transfer it to the Middle East, to the United States, or, of course, to our horror, to Russia, whose revenues from not so much gas but from oil have surged as a result of the world uh, price shock in energy. So this is another way of thinking about the way in which a rise in energy prices does not produce on aggregate an inflationary push in an economy like Europe, which imports its energy, uh, but in fact produces a squeeze on the rest of economic activity. So that's one, I think, idea to break, that an energy cost crisis drives directly towards an inflationary outcome. That may not be our future in Europe. It may, in fact, be that an energy price surge produces a deflationary outcome in Europe in the imminent future in terms of a recessionary shock. The second question to really dig into is the cost of living and social crisis, and to ask ourselves to what extent this is really a problem of inflation or whether it's really structurally a problem of inequality and poverty. Obviously, a squeeze to the standard of living happens because wages are not keeping up with prices. And that is not news in the Eurozone. Ever since 2020, wages have not kept track with prices in the Eurozone. There has been a real wage squeeze going on now for more than a year. It's becoming much more dramatic, of course, as a result of the current circumstance. And a standard of living squeeze becomes a social crisis if the extent of inequality in affluent societies is such that substantial minorities of people are forced below minimum living standards as a result of this inequality in movement between wages and prices. This is the example of us possibly introducing a tax, I don't know, for private swimming pools or giant SUVs. Do we really care about the rising cost of living for people in that kind of social class? It may be a political problem, but it's not a social crisis. It is the crisis at the bottom, and again, I'm illustrating this with British data because it's so graphic there. 14 million people may find themselves below the poverty line in the UK by the end of this year. 14 million people, that's about a quarter of the population below the poverty line as a result of this shock. But what's happening here is that inflation is, if you like, exposing structural problems which lie much deeper, which are to do essentially with inequality, with poverty, and the inadequacy of the welfare system. It's not an inflation problem as such. It's an inequality and poverty problem exposed by the inflationary dynamic. And this leads me to what might strike many of you in the room as a sort of paradoxical conclusion. But it's a paradoxical conclusion that's crucial for understanding the fundamental difference between the American and the European situation at this moment. In the United States right now, the United States Federal Reserve has more of an inflation problem than the ECB because it has less of a social crisis. Why does this make sense? It has a bigger inflationary problem because it has less of a social crisis because the logic of inflation in the United States right now is fundamentally different from that in Europe. Let's just go through the logical steps. A true inflation, as economists define it, is a change in the price of all goods and services. All goods and services. And what is a wage? A wage is the price of labor. When we conventionally define inflation as only the price of goods, we effectively exclude labor from that calculation. For an economist, an inflation is when prices and wages go up. So a cost of living squeeze, an attendant social crisis in which prices go up but wages don't adjust, is de facto evidence essentially of an incomplete or partial inflationary process. It means that the price of labor is not rising in line with the price of goods. It means, therefore, that a society is not truly experiencing a comprehensive inflation at all, but a one-sided price push at the expense of society. It's basically just a gigantic redistributional mechanism, inflation in that sense. It's just basically taking purchasing power away from wage earners and transferring it to the producers of goods. And as a result of that, and this is another way of stating the conclusion I reached earlier on, there is an extent to which a cost of living, social crisis producing price adjustment has a tendency to self-extinguish. Because as real incomes are squeezed, purchasing power collapses, and we will see this playing out in the fall as consumer expectations in Europe go off a cliff. We've not seen this before. Consumption will come down, the economy will contract, and we will see dramatic recessionary tendencies from that side of the equation. Flip this on, your, on its head, and you have the current American situation. If wages do keep up with prices, if real wages therefore fall less, and you have less of a social crisis, 
then inflation is more general and less likely to be self-extinguishing, and that is the reason why the Federal Reserve is on edge the way it is, because what we're seeing in the United States right now is what we're not seeing in Europe so far, which is a huge surge in nominal wages, especially at the bottom end of the labor market. It's really dramatic, and you can see the numbers here. So real wages in America are not shrinking as much. We don't have the social crisis, but the central bank is much more panicked because what this points to is an avalanche-like movement across society. Now, you might say to yourself, as Adam Tooze has gone away and discovered like an upsurge in class struggle in the United States in the last 18 months, which would be ridiculous despite all the headlines about the organizing success of trade unions at Starbucks and Amazon. I promise you, it's not happened. The largest labor dispute in the United States in the fall in 2021 was on my campus at Columbia University between the university and the graduate students. America is not witnessing a huge upsurge or shift in the balance of class power. But what America and Europe are experiencing in a very fascinating way are the consequences of two radically different ways of dealing with the COVID crisis. This is the story that Olaf Scholz is so proud of as chancellor. On the left-hand side, you have the American experience of the labor market shock of COVID. You can see Europe and America have very similar degrees of lost working hours, around about 20% in both cases. In the United States case, it's all in unemployment, the blue chunk. In other words, people were fired, and now they have to be rehired. And as employers collectively try to rehire literally millions of individual workers, even without a unionization drive, the workers gain individual bargaining power. They argue for higher wages, and that is the effect that we're seeing. It's like a mass atomized shift in the balance of bargaining power between employers and workers. It will evaporate as soon as the demand is gone, and that is what the Fed is bargaining on. The effect of the short-time working system in Europe is that workers never acquired that bargaining power. They were never pushed out of their jobs, so they stayed in their jobs. They're basically just sitting on their existing contracts. There is no basis for renegotiation, and so we see a much, much calmer development of wage income. But this is what the Fed is now doing. The Fed is driving hard to, in a classic way, stop this market-driven surge in nominal wages so as to calm inflation down. Now, you, when, once you've got this clear about this distinction between different types of inflation, the next question you might ask is if prices and wages go up in a kind of sort of inflation the US is experiencing, why would you care about it? Because after all, everyone's making out. Employers are raising their prices, workers are raising their wages, real incomes are staying level. From the point of view of social distribution, for instance, this is all good, everyone's, everyone's on the level. Well, there are losers, and they are the classic losers of inflation, and those are the savers, the holders of nominal assets, the holders of bonds, the classic losers in a rapid inflationary process. So the cynical, uh, conclusion that you reach if you push this analysis to its conclusion is that the Fed in the United States right now is engaging in the most classic logic of inflationary stabilization, which is to stabilize prices by means of raising unemployment, pushing back against this atomistic empowerment of American workers so as to stabilize financial markets. That is essentially the logic, transparently as that, in the United States. It is, tr as they will euphemistically say, raising rates to cool down the labor market, which means making people at the margin more unemployed, which basically means in the American case, black men who are the first people out of the labor market and the last people in. And that is the logic by which they will cool the labor market, take the inflationary pressure down, stabilize bond markets. And this, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to say, in a market economy like the United States, is what the commitment to price stability means. That's what that bargain effectively implies. And that is the normal mechanism of ordinary transmission in monetary policy. Europe's situation is far worse than that. <laughs> if you thought that sounded bad, Europe's situation is far worse than that. Because if Europe had this problem, the ECB's decision today would be the big news. And we all know perfectly well the big news is what the, not what the ECB did today, but what the governments of Europe will decide tomorrow. In Europe, we're dealing with a much bigger problem. Now, we could be in an even worse situation. And it's worth saying this, because the Federal Bank of, the Central, Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, doesn't just make monetary policy for the United States. The Federal Reserve makes global monetary policy. And as American interest rates go up, the state standing of low-income countries and emerging markets around the world gets crushed because their debt burden goes up, the dollar strengthens, the cost of their imports rises, and in an extreme case, you end up in Sri Lanka's position, 
um, earlier this year, unable to pay your debts, unable to pay for your imports. And when we talk about inflationary crises and energy crises, it's important to just anchor ourselves realistically against the global backdrop that says that's what it looks like when it gets really bad. So let's just put that there. If America is in the position of doing ordinary monetary policy and Sri Lanka is in the position of experiencing a classic low-income country most vulnerable in the global system problem, the situation of Europe right now is somewhere in between. You will have noticed, perhaps, from stories in the news, that as of today, the euro stands at one to the dollar. So the euro is feeling the pinch that emerging market currencies are feeling too. The Fed makes monetary policy for everyone, including the Europeans. One of the reasons why the ECB had to do what it did today was to match the Fed. The Fed's doing 75 basic points, so 0.75% of 1%. So the ECB has to do the same thing. But of course, in Europe, that is basically buffered, right? The people who joined the euro to gain current protection against currency crises made the right gamble. They got protection against currency crises. That's not one of their issues. They have a whole range of other issues to deal with. The fact the euro is at parity against the dollar is the last thing in the world anyone in Europe ought to be worried about. And when the ECB starts worrying about it, you know they've really lost the plot. That is beside the point. What matters right now is the energy price shock and the attendant social crises. Now, if we go back to this triple, this trio of problems, the way an economist, an economic policymaker, looks at this is to follow what's called Tin Bergen's law. You've got three problems, you've got three targets, so what you need is three instruments. If you don't have as many instruments as you've got problems, you're going to have a trade-off issue because you're going to use one instrument to fix two problems, like the interest rate to fix both unemployment and inflation, and then you're going to have a trade-off we call it the Phillips curve. If you've got enough instruments for each problem, you can target each problem with an instrument. And in the technocrats' mind right now, when they are not out of their minds with panic, when they are coolly sitting down and looking at the Europeans' problem, they allocate an instrument to each one of these problems. We've already spoken about one. The ECB is targeting the inflation rate. And when you ask them, why the hell did you do what you did today? How is this going to help? They'll say, I see a problem. It's eight, it's eight going on 10% inflation. I have one instrument. It's the interest rate, and I'm going to use it. Until you make that problem going away, I'm pulling my interest rate lever. That is, they're going, that's going to be their answer. They're going to run all four long until something happens. But what are we going to do about the other two dimensions of the problem? We need other instruments. And the answers we're already clear, and this is what I hope we're going to spend most of our evening talking about, is what we're going to do on the other side. Because on the social crisis side, it's clear that we need to do income supplements, tax benefits of various types to hit that problem. And as so far as we're going to address the energy price surge directly, we need to take measures that address energy markets, price caps, support for energy companies, up to and including, and let's open the bandwidth of debate here. If you talk to the people in Leipzig on Monday, what they wanted to do was put economic sanctions against Russia on the table too. Right? That is a legitimate extension of this argument. We may agree or disagree, but then they're, they're joining up the dots. It's not a crazy thing to do. The question, of course, is how we balance all these policies out against each other, which I'm sure is going to be the frame of our conversation this evening, and it is what every government in Europe is having to do right now. So I want, in the last few minutes of my talk, simply to sketch some of the dilemmas we face. Because as neat as this is, one problem, one instrument, one problem, another instrument. The problem is these things interact with each other, and the scale of the interventions that are necessary at this point is gigantic, and we are only just beginning to come to terms with this. This is the first session I've done on this problem publicly. It is going to dominate the agenda. We are embarked on a historic experiment. We should be clear about this. To measure how historic, look at this. Many of you will have followed this debate. This is Isabella Weber, a brave young German economist who, in the pages of The Guardian in December, wrote a, uh, I thought, quite ill-advised piece at the time saying we should use price controls to prevent inflation in Europe. Didn't make much sense to me at the time. I reviewed her book very kindly. I love it. It's great about China. I couldn't see why it would matter right now. And this is the FT this week, right? So price controls are on the agenda. And it's a little bit like the papacy advocating birth control. Right? This is not supposed to happen. We were supposed to have gotten over the price controls thing. We lecture every single emerging market and low-income country in the world that they must give up price controls on fossil fuels. It's an unspeakably bad thing to be doing. We all know it. Right? But we're doing it anyway, and we're going to do it on a huge scale, and it's already happening. And this is a measure of just how messed up and how confused this crisis has made the policy discussion. Because it I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad choice, but it is a very complicated choice to make. 
Why are price controls such a terrible idea? Does they remove the incentive to economize on the thing that you're controlling the price of? So you can regulate that problem by only protecting a certain amount. I can see we're already getting to get into the debate. Higher income households and firms consume more energy. So the more price you control, the more benefit they get. It reduces the incentive to supply, ultimately. If you actually control the supply price as well, the suppliers won't provide you any. So then you're actually going to have to span the gap between the price you pay to the supplier and what the consumer pays. And the government is on the hook for that. So it becomes a huge fiscal problem. And it will therefore create gigantic fiscal issues. This is the problem in emerging markets. It's the problem that Argentina has. It's one of the big issues with the IMF. Why do you do price controls? Because the social pain is unbearable. Right? You do them because you don't think the market's actually sending any reasonable signals or anything more. We don't really need the price to, for gas to go any higher than it currently is for us to realize there's not enough gas. There's not extra information coming from that. You may think the price is driven by speculators and want to intervene for that reason. But I think most importantly right now, and it's an overtly political reason, somebody has to show they're in control of this gigantic crisis. And the thing that consumers are freaked out about is the price and the bill and it doesn't help to say to them, right, you know what we're going to do because economists tell us to? We're going to subsidize your income instead. People simply do not find that a credible answer to the problem. It's really striking because economists all over the world would say, no, you shouldn't do that. Don't control prices for all of the reasons we started with. And I'm just taking you around this decision tree to see how confusing and like a dilemma this is. Don't control prices because it's inefficient. It subsidizes the wrong people. Don't do that. Subsidize the people who need it directly. Give low-income households higher incomes. That makes sense. That's efficient. That's the socially equitable way to do this. The problem is that if you only give benefits to low-income households, you stigmatize them. If the take-up amongst disadvantaged groups, because disadvantaged groups suffer multiple overlapping disadvantages, they're not best placed to actually empower themselves to claim benefits, so they don't. The targeting error is inevitable. It's structural. You aren't always going to be able to find the people that you need to support to support them. And finally, if welfare is only for poor people, it will ultimately be weakly politically anchored and at risk of cuts, of slicing. There will not be collective ownership. And so I think, though it's much less efficient, it makes political sense in a deep way. And this is not something to dismiss easily as from a technocratic point of view, to actually have a blend of general measures which bring everyone in, as efficient as the, inefficient as that may be, with targeted measures which support people. So you can see all of the trade-offs that we're having to make. What we have very rarely seen so far is any conversation about that fundamental problem, the problem of the structural disadvantage of the weakness in the welfare state, which creates the social crisis in the first place, which is why I harped on this obvious problem at the beginning. Why is it that there are people so disadvantaged in our society that a rising energy bill crushes them? That should be an indictment of the societies we live in. How do we give one question that could be asked to address inflation is how we empower working people and the recipient of social welfare to fight it themselves by making claims and empowering them to make claims. Rather than discussing in a technocratic fashion who gets what and how we allocate from above, empower people to claim from below. The terrifying thing, and it's spelled out extraordinarily explicitly in the discussions of economists, is that economists around the world are quite explicitly committed to the project of making sure that doesn't happen. Why? And I don't say this in a conspiratorial tone. The BIS spells it out for you in econometric terms. They will literally say the longer an inflation burns, the higher the tendency of people to unionize in trade unions, the more union strength you have, the larger the collective bargaining power. Once the collective bargaining power is there, inflationary expectations become unanchored. Therefore, we should act against inflation hard now to stop that process from happening. Spelled out in black and white in the most recent report of the BIS. In so many words, with all of the econometrics to prove the connection. And why would you want to do that? Because you might say, from the point of view of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung or IG Metall, what's wrong with more empowerment? The answer of the technocrat is, because that makes my job incredibly difficult. Because unanchored inflationary expectations are the nightmare of the 1970s. And the, I would much rather a world in which I freely dispose of the income and wealth distribution and pick who I give resources to, and I could, can, of course, be a benign technocrat and give them to the right people. But the crucial thing is I remain in control of the process. Because if the process is not controlled, then the struggle of mistrust within society will require me to do really, really nasty things 
to demonstrate that I'm serious about inflation control. This is literally how it goes. I'm going to have to prove I'm a conservative beast by doing beastly things, because if we actually have a play of social forces in societies, you won't trust me to pull the trigger when I have to. It's really an incredibly perverse logic. But it's playing out before our very eyes in moments like this, where you have the uh, Social Democratic Chancellor of Germany, as I referred to earlier on, invoking the possibility of the gilet jaune as a force that will force and remove control of policy from the government. And that is the reason why the government must act. It's this extraordinary kind of cycle that we're currently in, where the question could be, how do we restructure society to give people voice so they can defend themselves more proactively? The question is why I mean this quite seriously, therefore, this is really posing questions of the social contract, not just in the, in the, in the distributional sense, but in the question of the distribution of political power. Who at this moment has the right to decide is also up for grabs. What is clear, and this really brings things to a conclusion, is that whatever way we go, we are now talking about historically large amounts of money that is going to have to be mobilized to fill these gaps between the prices that consumers pay and the prices the global market is demanding. This is a FT compilation from a couple of weeks ago. It's already completely out of date. Uh, this was in Lastungspaket number three. This takes you to 2.5% for Germany. And this is Liz Truss's package uh, this morning. It takes you closer to three or even larger. The package they announced today takes you over off this graph. Britain is now moving into a zone which is even larger. And so we are talking now about a historic fiscal challenge. And the question is, how is this going to be managed? And this is the final observation that I'll end with. In general, inflations of prices and wages, as in the United States, which conform quite closely to what economists think of as inflations, which is all prices and wages moving against monetary assets which remain fixed, in which the inflation, therefore, is a challenge to monetary stability, which you meet with central bank action, the story remains confined within a world of a market moving, financial assets at stake, and the central bank using interest rates to stabilize the story. In the world that we are in in Europe right now, when we're dealing with a cost of living shock, which is fundamental, is existential, and he's posing basic questions about the social order and the political order indeed, there is no way in which the government as such cannot become involved. This cannot be handed off anymore to the central bank. And what then happens, however, is a shock to the bond market, not from the demand side, because people don't want to hold bonds because the inflation is eating away at their value, but because governments are going to have to issue bonds to the tune of several percentage point of GDP. And ladies and gentlemen, when that question is posed in Europe, we all know where that leads. We are not going to be able to get past a conversation about the fiscal constitution of Europe in this crisis. Anyone who believes going into this that this can be contained is in March, April stage 2020 denial. That was the stage the last German government, Angela Merkel with Olaf Scholz in the finance ministry was in, in March and April 2020. And Europe's survival depended on Berlin changing its mind on this issue. That is the critical moment in May when the Macron and, Scholz, uh, Macron and uh, Merkel governments got together with Scholz and Bruno Le Maire brokering the deal. That is the crucial moment. That's the test that Europe passed. In 2020, the German government explicitly, and you can talk to every German diplomat in the world, and they'll tell you the same story, defined that as an emergency, an exceptional European action defined by the COVID crisis. Well, if this isn't an exceptional emergency, if indeed Schultz is not right to say that we now live in the site of Zeitenwende, in other words, times have changed, not just once, but fundamentally, and you think you can, as it were, get through this with a simple improvisation, we're really, at that stage, we're in denial, right? And, and the question really will be how long it will take before the decision makers in Europe realize the scale of this and what damage will be done along the way. And the test will start tomorrow when we see how coherent this package is. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward very much to the discussion.